This originally was going to be the day 3 and 4 review, but it is way off track for that. So now this video is dedicated to deciphering all the information revealed by the Shacklethorn heist. The Shacklethorn heist, a single day heist that can be done either stealth or loud, although Locke is the contractor for the heist, it is the elephant now out of Commissioner Garrett's custody who gives us information about the events that are about to go down. Okay gang, we've received a communique from the elephant. He claims to want to help us. Seems that in the early 1900s, a Kataru member stole what he calls a family heirloom. This person then bought his way onto the famous Shacklethorn expedition bound for Antarctica. His presence, according to the elephant, doomed the voyage from the start. The familiarity of this is not a coincidence, despite the elephant's caginess. The ship and crew were lost until recently when the wreckage was found crushed in the ice, far from the original planned route. A couple of miles from the wreckage, they also found a mummified corpse who looks to have died rather horrifically, and a sled along with a collection of artifacts. The items recovered are going to be auctioned in secret to a select group of decadent society types, and the elephant says that one of those items will help us with the device in the kitchen. There is a lot to discuss, first and foremost, the heist. It is a small to medium sized indoor map with both loud and stealth objectives playing out almost identically. The heist is pretty easy and can be done fairly quickly, so quickly in fact that there's an achievement to do the heist within 5 minutes. It is quite the enjoyable heist, as I mentioned in the previous video, it is based on the Orchid Court Mansion, but as we learned from the Day Force Twitch stream, the backside of it. A lot of the heist is inspired by James Bond films. So after hacking a few things, debating the auctioneer and opening the vault, what is it that we are after? Well this uh, black tile. Yeah, it looks confusing, but don't fret, Kenny is here to explain it all to you. Remember that missing hexagon piece from the scribe's coffer? Well, we got it! According to the in-game trophy for completing the Shacklethorn heist, it is called the Obsidian Plate, and its description reads... Some things are best forgotten, least the secrets they hold undo the world. Offer your flesh, your heart, to starve the darkness. Stare into the abyss long enough, and you will welcome the end. For in the cracks and hollows, the earth is good. What that means is still up for interpretation, but what we do know is this piece also resonates from notes played on Scarface's piano. Allow me to show you a clip from my stream of my fantastic pianist skills. And when you make the obsidian plate resonate, we get a whole tablet of the new language. Thankfully, we already deciphered most of it on day one, so learning the missing characters becomes a lot easier. The first part of the plate reads, If needs must, for those who are called to remake your legacy from within. Again, it's not really clear what this means, but I think of it as some sort of message to the person seeking Baldwin's lament. Something I didn't mention on day one is that the language, whilst based on English, is actually read right to left. I merely flipped the text 180 degrees so it was easier to read, but now that there are icons involved, I thought it was best to clear it up now. Next we have four pyramids. They are Pyramid of the Sun, Dreaming Temple, Great Pyramid of Cheops, and Great Ziggurat. This helps fill out our cipher. Now we're only missing four letters. B, J, V, and X. To explain this next part, I have to talk briefly about how substitute deciphering works. Basically, because we have a firm understanding of the English language, we know which characters appear most often throughout the language. We can then use frequency analysis to figure out the most occurring symbols in a cipher, and then assume them to be English's most occurring letters. Then through trial and error, we can eventually make words and correctly identify each corresponding symbol. The problem here is that numbers are a whole other problem because you can't make a word out of a number, so it becomes very hard to learn what represents one, two, three, and so on and so forth. And with such a small sample of text, literally everything on this kitchen table, it would be impossible. So where am I going with all this? Well, we can actually work out what symbol represents what number, and even a few more things. You see, the four pyramids, well, only three of them actually exist. The Pyramid of the Sun, the Great Pyramid of Cheops, which is Giza, and the Great Ziggurat, which is the Great Ziggurat of Ore. 
They also each represent a different mythos. The Pyramid of the Sun is Mesoamerican, the Great Pyramid of Cheops is Egyptian, and the Great Ziggurat of Ur is Sumerian. The text underneath each are longitude and latitude coordinates, meaning we can look up the real life coordinates and then learn what each number is represented as. The whole point of bringing that up is that a lot of people might be under the impression that all four temples are relevant. However, as I explained, three of them are used as references to help decipher the numbers. And as such, we can find the location of the only fictional temple, the Dreaming Temple, which is located at 47 degrees, 8 minutes, 59.6 seconds south, and 126 degrees, 43 minutes, 0 seconds west. And that is... the middle of the South Pacific Ocean. It is actually close to Point Nemo, the spot furthest away from any landmass. So it might be a little anticlimactic, but it at least lines up with the FBI email, and it is actually the location of Relierre, the sunken city of Cthulhu, depicted in H.P. Lovecraft's books so we may have caused the Dream Temple to emerge. But we've actually seen the Dream Temple before. This one painting depicting a ship in rough seas and a pyramid with a light at its peak. This is without a doubt the Dream Temple, and this painting was introduced back with the Diamond Heist. We have a few more things to discuss from the tablet. We have a set of hieroglyphics from different mythos. The first is Mesoamerican, specifically Aztec, and it depicts two gods. Tezcatipoca and Quetzalcoatl, who I will here on refer to as Tez and Quetz. There is a lot to their creation myth, but to cover it quickly, the Five Suns story describes four great ages preceding the present world, each ending in a catastrophe, each usually caused by either Tez or Quetz. The second are from ye old classic Mesopotamia. In their creation myth, Enema Elish, Timat, one of the primordial beings, gave birth to the first generation of deities. If you remember in the previous video, I mentioned the god of the sky, Anu, and the god of the earth, Enki. Well, Timat is basically their mother. Well, the god of the earth, Enki, had a child called Maduk, god of the storms. Maduk was an extremely powerful deity, and when Timat went on a rampage, Maduk was the one who slayed her after gathering the strength from the other deities. After defeating her, he was regarded as king of the gods. Ironically enough, Maduk was the name I gave myself in my own Discord, which you should join if you haven't, link in the description. Anyway, after Maduk defeated Timat, he forms the heavens and the earth from her divided body. So far, we have two creation myths involving two powerful beings clashing and then the beginning of a new world, which makes this last one out of place. The third is Egyptian, and currently there is still a bit of debate around who they are, but at the moment the figures represent Basset and Anubis. That being the case, there are not many myths that the guys over on the secret thread have found that involve these two deities and the themes of death and rebirth of the world. So the message to take away from these hieroglyphics is still a bit vague due to the fact we can't find a common theme between all three of these mythos. So we will most likely end up revisiting this when something new comes out or if someone has a revelation. Moving on to the final items on the Obsidian Tablet, we have another sentence that says Ark of the Watcher with more coordinates. Looking up the coordinates on Google Maps leads you to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, AKA the motherfucking White House. We're doing it, mate. 1610. Maybe we go there for our next big score. So we don't know what the Ark of the Watcher is, but we do know what it looks like. Kind of. Another one of the paintings from the diamond shows three people standing in front of these weird objects in the desert. If we take the shape of the Ark of the Watcher and overlay it onto this painting, you'll see that it's a perfect match. So whatever this thing is, it's at the White House. Another part of this image involves a guy in a robe standing in front of the Ark. We also have seen this image before. We found it on the FBI files. After Bane was taken from us, Sergeant Brian Painter sent a copy of a crumpled piece of paper to Garrett asking if it had any importance. This image had three words on it. The top of it says Nebuchadnezzar, the word on the forehead reads Watcher, we've encountered the term Watcher a lot so we should be pretty familiar with it, although we don't know exactly what they are or what they do. The final faded word on the chest reads Nephilim. This is a word you most likely haven't heard, 
except if you watched my previous video where I used the term to name a band. That segues us perfectly into the final image on the Obsidian tablet. The three stick figures and the word underneath which says Nephilim. Better start getting familiar with that word. Nephilims have many interpretations, but they are usually referred to as the Fallen, the Sons of Gods, or Fallen Angels. The Brown Divers Briggs lexicon gives the meaning as giants, and that's what we should focus on. Taking a look at the stick figures and comparing them to some of the paintings found throughout the game confirms the idea that these giant creatures are Nephilims. And more of these references are found throughout the Shacklethorn Mansion. One of these paintings we can heavily identify thanks to information from the Shacklethorn and Arctic Expedition. The RSV Baldwin, which we know was lost due to one of the Kataru members stealing the obsidian plate and boarding the vessel. This image showing the ship run aground the ice with a man, the original Lindenhurst, revealed by Duke in the safe house, and a dog sled fleeing with a giant Nephilim in the background, which we can assume he is running from. We now know from Shacklethorn that Lindenhurst had the astrolabe, the obsidian tablet, and the scribe's ring. That's the one with the reflected diamond on it. We also know that he died horrifically, having what appears to be his heart ripped from his chest, most likely from the Nephilim we saw him running from. In a new painting, we see the burning of the White House in 1814, and behind the building we can see a giant Nephilim which is implied to have been the cause of its destruction. To give you a sense of how giant these Nephilims are, the White House is 21 meters tall, that's 69 foot for you Americans. Using one of the obsidian tablet figures reveals that this particular Nephilim could be 47 meters tall, or well over 150 foot. We also have images of those giant skulls and frozen corpses of Nephilims from paintings, as well as the corpses of those giant creatures which we can assume to be Nephilims. But dead things and pictures are no threat to us, after all these could be a species long forgotten and past. However, if you use certain means to get outside of the Shacklethorn Mansion, if you go to the back and to the stairs, you can trigger a lightning strike. Revealed by the lightning strike, you can see the silhouette of a giant, a Nephilim, watching, waiting. There was another thing that was hinted at, but not by the tablet, but in the painting of the burning of the White House. If you look carefully near the bottom left, you can make out the shimmer of glasses watching. This would be the dentist. I haven't really touched on him, but there is a ton of stuff to suggest that he is immortal or has multiple incarnations. The entire diamond trailer has his signature glowing eyes, the screen at the end of Henry's Rock, and now in the Shacklethorn Mansion, this painting of Benjamin Franklin, which from certain angles will have his eyes glow the same as the dentist. Is the dentist Benjamin Franklin? He could very well be. The very final things from the Obsidian Tablet are these two constellation as icons. This particular part of the video was rewritten since it was just discovered by Moren over on the secret thread that both of these maps line up to a painting called Derelict, also from the Diamond Heist. Again, we've figured out where the imagery is from, but learning what it represents is another story. It's also worth noting that one of the circles is actually the Heil Triangle. But what does this all mean in terms of the Payday 2 story? Well, who knows? So many things are up in the air, and we need a lot more information to get the answers we want, and I will be there at the forefront of figuring it out. So if you want to keep ahead of the game, I'd appreciate it if you help support me. Something as simple as a like or a sub is greatly appreciated, since high quality stuff really isn't being supported by YouTube anymore. I've also got the Discord where you can discuss stuff and bug me, as well as the Twitch where I put no effort into and I can just relax and be myself and talk to you guys.